love you and we glorify your name. What a, just what an amazing blessing it is to be your sons and your daughters and to get together with brothers and sisters in Christ where the fullness of your love dwells. Your body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way, this church, to get to praise and honor your name. We are so humbled and so filled. So good. We love you, Lord. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Um, I don't even know how to transition in my sermon because I was going to say some smarty aleck things to begin with, but I'm just like overwhelmed in the awe of God at the moment. And that's okay. Um, when you realize how great a God that we have, and today we're going to be talking about marriage and our relationship with, between husband and wife. I'm getting some feedback from the, from the deal. Do I have my microphone on right? I, okay, I think so. Um, are y'all okay? Is the sound okay? We'll fix it real quick. If it's, if it's annoying, let me know. Is that okay, Greg? Okay, I, it may just be me. Excuse me. Um, I'm not blaming anybody in the booth. There's, we're good. They're, those are my friends back there. And they deserve honor, amen? They really do a lot of great work here. Yes, you can. <laughs> so, um, so today we're talking about fi- family dynamics for meaningful influence and... Uh, this passage in First Peter, it, it's one of these passages, that's like, this is one of the reasons why I like preaching through a book, because it will not permit me to miss the challenging and difficult passages that are in the Bible. Like when I started this series on First Peter, I'm like, I know I'm coming to chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Boy, get ready. As a matter of fact, Dwight, I thought today the best way for me to dress, and y'all are going to understand this in just a minute, was to, to get, have y'all seen a baseball catcher's outfit where they have the face mask and they got the chest pads and everything? That's what I feel like I need to equip myself with before I do this lesson. And y'all are like, well, John, wh- what are you talking about? Where are you coming from? And well, let me, let's just, let's just uh, read the text here for just a moment. Y'all may have to help me with the first slide. It's not connecting at the moment. Okay, here we go. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands. You already see where this is trouble for me, right? Boy, it got really quiet in here all of a sudden. It's like, some of you husbands, you're like, oh yeah, glad we showed up today, honey. I want you to listen close to John's lesson today. This one's for you. Uh, here we go. Wives in the same way. See, I'm already starting to create this gender divide between male, female, husband, wife. Uh, let me let's just get back to the word. In the same way, submit yourselves to your own husbands, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they will be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. When they see the purity and reverence of your lives, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold, jewelry, or fine clothes. Some of your husbands already, man, if my wife will just listen to this sermon, it's going to help our family budget immediately. So there we go. So verse 4, rather it should be that of the inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For in this, for this is the way that the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. I'm just seeing if I can hide myself here. This is going to be fun. Um, It was funny because I was last night. I was uh, I was eating with uh, Scott and Robin and and Kai and uh, Lannis, and Kai asked me. He says, "John, what are you preaching on tomorrow?" Two things, Kai, that my wife should submit and start calling me Lord. <laughs> I didn't hear any laughter from you ladies on that one at all. And then Robin spoke up and she says, Scott, don't get any ideas. The only thing I'm going to call you is a cab. <laughs> so anyway, or something like that, I don't know. 
I was talking to Landis this past week about this text, you know, and about wives submitting and referring to their husbands as Lord. And uh, she says, well, that, you know what God tells me? When we get, it, when we get in a discussion and, uh, and, and we're kind of at an impasse or whatever, God just says, submit. The Bible says submit right there. Submit. So anyway, so Kai, this lesson is for you today. Um, now, I, it, so here we go. Here we go. So let me stop for just a moment. Um, oh, let me finish the text. You are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. So let me back up for just a moment um, and deal with this issue. So before we jump off into this text and we're talking about transformative relationships, how to transform and deepen a relationship between a husband and wife. We ought to talk about submission. And here's my point that I want to make today. Um, this is the big idea, that submission is actually what opens the door to blessings in our lives. Did I say that slow enough? Do I need to say it again? Submission opens the door to God's blessings in our lives. Now, I want you to think about this. Is there anything good that has happened to you in your life that did not come about in some meaningful way through submission? I mean, you could just think about that for just a moment. Let me illustrate it this way with maybe an interesting story since I'm picking on Scott and Robin. So, I think it was back in March of this year, Scott took me fishing, and, and uh, we were on Lake Graham, and, and, and uh, I had my idea of some things that I wanted to fish with, and I had my fish and stuff, but my fish and stuff ain't like Scott's fish and stuff. And Scott saw my fish and stuff, and he says, John, you ought to fish with my stuff. Like, you need to throw that right there. And I was like, hmm, okay. Follow me. Are y'all you, are following me so far? So I picked up the rod, and I'm fishing with his stuff. And uh, so we're going along, and sure enough, I hooked into a fish, and I'm like fighting this fish and reeling this fish up, and this is a huge bass, and I got it up to the boat and got it in the boat. We weighed the thing. It was almost, I think it was like one ounce shy of seven pounds. It's the biggest bass I've caught in Young County yet to this day. It happened because I submitted to Lord Scott. Are y'all following me so far? See, I, now, I don't refer to Scott as Scott anymore. He is Lord Scott. And you're like, can you call another person Lord? We're going to talk about that in just a few moments. So I don't have, a, I, the good came about because I listened, I obeyed, I submitted. Now, and you just begin to think about this. Think about a football team. What does a football team or a basketball team or any kind of team do? If they submit to the coach and they submit to the leaders that are running the play, that's when good things happen. Bad things happen when you don't submit, right? Um, do you, you, you think about, I want you to think about this text right here. I promise y'all, Brian and I checked this earlier. Go to the, go to, go to the next slide. Go to the next one. Go to the, we're, we'll come back to that one in just a moment. Thank you. Proverbs 3, verses 3 through 6. So here's the door of blessing that God wants us to open up. He says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Faithfulness, submission, obedience, Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Remember what Jesus, Luke 2, 52, he grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. And what did Jesus do when Mary comes looking for him? Where have you been? Did you not know I had to be about my father's house, right? And then what does Luke tells us? Jesus went home and submitted to them. I mean, so we see this. So Jesus submits to the Father. He submits to his mom and dad. Submission is what opens up the door of blessing in our life. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Verse 5, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, and I put it in bold red, submit. Let's, let's read this together. Here we go. In all your ways, submit to him. And he will make your paths straight. So think about this. The, the text that was read just earlier Jesus didn't consider equality with God as something to be grasped. What did Eve do with the fruit? She grasped it, 
Follow the, follow the idea here. She grasped it, and the reason she grasped this is because she was not being submissive to, to Adam or to God. Adam didn't assert himself in this text. He didn't share with her, saying, no, we can't do that. This is not in God's will. So she, she grasped, and she wanted equality with God. Look to what Jesus does. So is Jesus equal with God? Thank you, Tom, he is. Did anybody else say, if you agree with Tom, say amen, just on this point. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Yeah, <laughs> amen? All right, Jesus is divine. He is fully God, he's fully in the flesh. And yet, whose will did Jesus submit to? The Father above. And because he submitted to God, even death on a cross, as was read a while ago, what did God do with him? He exalted him and his name is above all names, and at his name every uh, tongue will bow, and, and or every knee will bow, and tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Your salvation, my salvation, came about, the greatest gift of all, it came about through submission. So is submission good or bad? All right, you, are you following me so far? So, so, so first of all, we just, we just need to lay this out and just recognize this, this to begin with, that submission opens up the door for God's blessings to come into our lives. So rather than read this text and impose our, our, our ideas today about men and women and individuals and individual rights and, you know, is this just an outdated form of family or is this an authoritative form of family? Uh, is Peter affirming the Roman view of the family here and working within these constructs? Because people are like, yeah, we'll take our ideas and we will impose those on the text and hopefully today we're going to understand this text and let the text impose its ideas on us and we're going to have hearts open to God and be willing to submit because submission opens up the door to God's blessing thank you let's try that one more time submission opens up the door of God's blessings yes all right so now we're ready we are ready to hear what Peter has to say so first Peter let's go back to the text first in uh, verse one go back to verse one go back one more oh that was I'm sorry I'm sorry you were there all right there we go that's uh, the three I thought it was verse three but it's actually verse one so let's let's um let's work through the text here for just a moment. Wives, in the same way, submit yourselves to your, to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives. So I want you to think about this. So, so in, that sa in chapter 2, where Peter teaches us to live good lives so that when others accuse us of wrong, they'll be shown wrong, and they'll bring glory to God. So the idea is, he, he says, um, live, verse 12, live good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So good lives live in good deeds brings glory to God is what Peter is saying. Now, how do I do that? Because I'm in relationship to the civil authorities. And what does Peter say? You need to submit to those governing authorities. And when they accuse you of doing wrong, let them see your good lives. Because good lives doing good deeds bring glory to God. And then he teaches slaves. Slaves, you, you know, you, you, you submit to your masters. Why, why do you do that? Because living good lives, doing good deeds brings glory to God. And here he says, wives, submit to your husbands. Now, why? Why is he telling these wives to submit to their husbands? Well, because that's the strength, because that's how God said it in creation. That's the created order, brother. John, I can't believe you didn't know that. Well, now let's back up for just a second, because does Peter bring up the created order here? No. What is Peter interested in here? Good lives, doing good deeds, bringing glory to God. Who is, what wives is he talking to in the church? They are wives whose husbands are not. Did y'all catch that? That's important to understand in the text. Because 
he's talking, he's telling these wives to submit not because their husbands are worthy, because their husbands are so great. He's telling them this is how they're going to be won over to Jesus. Now, how are these wives trying to convert their husbands? They're trying to do it with what? Do y'all know what this means? The mouth. Words. Did y'all notice it's in the plural? He says they can be won over without words. Evidently, they've been using words a lot. Do a lot of words work? Carrie, don't, don't say a word. It's like, John, that's why your sermons need to be shorter. Do a lot of words work? Wives? Thank you. You are correct. No, they don't. That was beautiful. That goes down in John's book of funny things that happened in sermons. They don't. It's not effective. But what is effective, according to Peter, is a wife that will live from a position of strength. And because she is strong in the Lord, submitting to her husband or showing deference and honor to him is not a threat to her. Okay. Okay. It's going to be won over with words. So these are women who have unbelieving husbands, and he is teaching them that you can win over your husbands who are unbelievers by your behavior. And then he says, when they see the purity and reverence of your lives, and your beauty shouldn't come from outward ador adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles of the wearing of gold or fine clothes. I don't know what y'all want me to do with the text, so I'm just gonna like put it out there and let's just let the word do the work. I mean, if you, if you were to sit down like right now and think about from head to toe, Let's see, I got, let me do it, I'll, I'll, I'll be the guinea pig. It's a $100 pair of shoes, $40 pair of pants, how much, am, that's $140, right? It's probably a $20 belt, so I'm up to $60, uh, $160, it's uh, about a $20 shirt. I got it on sale at Cabela's. Um, so that's 180 I got a t-shirt, t-shirt costs more than this shirt, it was like, it's a Columbia, it's 20 bucks, so I'm, or maybe a little more, let's just say 200 my haircut at Misty's caught me, cost me 20 bucks, so that's like 220. And then my ring, how much did my ring cost? Do you remember? 400? That's a long time ago, right? We've been married for 30 years. That's a lot of money back then. So, it's a, so what did I get up to? 220 and 400? How much does that equal? What is it? 600? 20, 2600? 600. <laughs> 620, there we go. Can I get 640? All right, all right, I'm wearing $620 worth of clothes right now in adornment. And y'all are thinking right now, you look so good, John, don't you? Amen? I'm kidding. Now, you do that. You do that. And then I'm just going to let God do with that whatever God needs to do with that. But here's what I know. We think about you know, guys, I'm not just going to pick on ladies. Guys can spend a lot of money at the gym getting all chiseled. But here's what we need to know. That what God's interested in is what's chiseled in stone. What is he? You know, the commands of God. And how those commands of God transform our character. It is our character that we ought to spend the most effort on. Because that is what's enduring. It does not perish. Go to the next slide for me. Go to the, um, verse 4. Rather, it should be that of the inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. These things don't perish. For this is the way that the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands like Sarah and, and so on. So, submission is not because of the created order of male superiority and female subordination. That's not in the text. But submission is for the missional order of Jesus. It's how you win your husbands to Christ. Um, now this is in the midst, I want you to understand that a woman in Roman society that had become a Christian would be a threat to her husband who is not. Um, 
and this is what's hard for us to, to grasp. Um, in Roman society, when you got married, the, the male would be about 30 years old. The female would be about 16. And it, you didn't get, it wasn't because y'all fell in love with, you, with each other. It was that the dads got together and decided they were going to get married. Marriages were arranged so that you could improve your status that was always the goal. And so it would benefit the fathers the most. And so the father is the Lord of the home. And so the, the young teenage girl, middle teens girl would be given to a 30-year-old man. And she had no choice in the matter. And that's how marriage was arranged in the Roman world. And the wife then must adopt the religion of her husband. She had to worship his gods and follow his religion. Um, if she didn't bear the, the, the man children, which was the, the sole reason for marriage in Roman society was to bear legitimate children. There's all kinds of quotes where um, talks about the males in their society having extra relationships with others, but the wife was for the bearing of legitimate children. If she couldn't bear a child, she would be divorced. When children were born to her, the midwife would put the baby on the ground. Yeah, this is, you can read about any of this uh, in dictionaries and history books. The midwife would put the, the new infant on the ground, and the father, the master, the lord of the family, would decide if he would pick up the child or not. If he did not pick up the child, a slave in the house would take the child and dispose of the child at the dump. This was common. This is how life was done. And guess which gender was preferred? Because you could pass on the family name. Which gender costs more, <laughs> costs more money? I better not go there. John McCord, you know better and say stuff like that. So, you know, and so w young girls were exposed um, to the dump and would, they could be picked up and enslaved by others. And so this was common. Um, one guy, or one, one uh, philosopher was quoted, mistresses we keep for the sake of pleasure, concubines for the daily care of the body, but wives to bear us legitimate children. The idea that men and women might be equal partners in marriage did not exist in Roman society. I cannot stress that enough. Um, let me demonstrate it this way. Uh, go to, go to, here we go. So this is Aristotle. I mean, so, uh, yeah, Aristotle. He says, so stands the male in relation to the female. On the basis of nature, he is superior, she is inferior. He is the ruler, she is the ruled. Go to the next slide. So this is um, uh, Diogenes Laertes, and he's quoting Socrates, and he says there were three blessings for which he was grateful to fortune. This was Socrates, what he would say. First, that I was born a human and not a human being and not one of the brutes, a beast. Next, I was born a man and not a woman thirdly a greek not a barbarian go to the next slide this is a male jewish benediction at the time of jesus here's so when a male would get up in the morning this is his benediction a blessing to god blessed are you O god that i am a jew and not a gentile this was commonly this was well known a well-known benediction blessed are you O god that i am free and not a slave blessed are you O god that i am a man and not a, a woman. Go to the next slide. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, nor is there male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. What did you notice? Did you notice the exact same words and the exact same order? Do you see the Apostle Paul taking a shot at how status was arranged in the world and how it's renewed in the church? Go to the next slide. I want you to see mutuality. Mutuality exists. So, so before we talk about created order or who's in charge and all that kind of stuff, I just want you to see, like, like you, you just saw a text that put everybody, all these different people with different status in the same category. 
Notice this text of mutuality. (laughs) It's one of my favorites in the Bible. (laughs) The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to his husband. In the Roman world, they would have, the Roman husbands would have stopped right there and they would have said, Amen. Preach it, Paul. That's, I like this guy. But then it says what? In the same way, the husband does not have authority. Did you see that? Over his own body, but yields it to his wife. And now he's going, this I've never heard before. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. You're going to see that devoted to prayer as this being represented in Peter as well. What do you notice? Likewise, in the same way, mutual consent. Who's superior and who's inferior? Do you pick up on this in the New Testament? I know we take our ideas from society. We take our ideas from 2,000 years ago from Roman and Greek society. And then we impose those on the text. But if you actually get into the text, you're going to discover mutuality in marriage. Um, And this is not a threat. This is a blessing for us in our lives. So, Peter isn't calling for submission to restore a created order. He's calling for submission for the missional order of Jesus. And so let's deal with this. Go to the next slide. So, oh, well, the other thing that I was going to say is, You have to understand how threatening this would be to a husband. So his wife is getting up. She is getting herself all gussied up. And she's going to a service where there's both men and women. And they're sharing a meal together. If you, you may not know this, but in Roman society, guess who sat at the table? Uh Uh-huh, guess where the women sat. If they were permitted at the table, they would be at the end of the table. And then when business got talked about, they would be dismissed to leave. And the children didn't sit at the table, and slaves certainly didn't sit at the table, but at the church, who sits at the table? Do you see how this is threatening to this husband? It's like, like this is threatening all of society. It's going to undermine our relationship. Go to, the next, go to the next slide. So I want to talk about, so what does it mean that Sarah, so, so Peter says, the women, the holy women of old, they refer to their husbands as Lord, uh, like, like Abraham. There is the Lord in the text, and that's the, the holy name of Yahweh. And then there's Adonai, which is the middle one. That's Lord. Jesus, or kuros, is the, uh, the Greek word. And then there is kurios, lowercase l, Lord. Like y'all remember the story where the, um, the Philippian jailer comes to Paul and si- Silas and the NIV says, uh, you know, he comes and he, he, he gets on the feet at the feet of these men and he says, in the, the NIV says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? The text is curious. It's Lord. Actually, what he said was, lords, what must I do to be saved? So I just want us to understand how these different scriptures are used. Go to the next slide. Um, this is where this is, he's quoting from Genesis 18. Abraham and Sarah were very old. Sarah was past the age of childbearing. Sarah laughed to herself and she thought, Am I, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? And so she, in her thoughts, she, uh, she refers to, Abraham is Lord. Go to the next slide. I want you to see this, though. This is a little side note. Is that God does tell Abraham to listen and to submit to Sarah. I just want you to see this in the Old Testament. It's not just Sarah submitting to Abraham, but Abraham submits to Sarah. Like, Sarah does not want Hagar and Ishmael, the slave child, to be with them anymore, and she wants them gone. She tells Abraham in verse 10, get rid of the slave woman and her son. Verse 11, the matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you because it's through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. God tells Abraham to listen to Sarah, I just want you to see that. Go to the next slide. There's one more. I just have to point this out. 
So Abimelech takes, kind of takes Abraham's wife, Sarah, and wants her to join his harem. God shows up to Abimelech in a dream and says, you're a dead man if you touch this woman. He says, you are as good as dead because of the woman you have taken. She is, and the NIV says, and they're chicken. They are chicken as is every other English translation. They, they, they translate this, she is a married woman. The Hebrew word is Baal. Like y'all have heard of the God Baal. It means Lord or Master. What Moses said is, you, you don't mess with this married woman. Or you don't mess with this woman. She is a Baal to her husband. She is Lord or Master to Abraham. Baal signifies owner or by extension Lord, a master, to have dominion over. So I just want to say that's actually in the text. So before y'all get a quote in Genesis and like, wife, you need to submit. I just want you to see that mutual submission is not just something in the New Testament, it's there in the Old. That Abraham, or Abraham is referred to, or Sarah is referred to as Abraham's Baal, her Lord, her sir. So, Let's go, let's go, go back to um, the text, or actually go forward, I'm sorry. Go forward to the next slide. And I want to close out with this. So, so wives, what are you called to do? You're called to submit. Um, it's for the mission of Jesus. Don't get stressed out about adornment. Don't focus on what's going on the outside. You're not going to be judged on the outside. It's what's going on on the inside. And it's through your actions, not your words, that you're going to bring your husband to Jesus. But whatever you do, be faithful to God. Don't give way to fear. Even if he mistreats you, even if he's suspect of you going to church, even if it's taking away time from him and you don't go to his parties and you don't worship his gods and he gets angry with you, just be willing to submit. Don't give way to fear. Just stay the course. That's what Peter is saying. The mission is that important. And now he's going to talk to husbands. So here we go, guys. So if, if y'all were in my class this morning, you know what I said? I said to the men and women, I said, you do your verse. Don't worry. So, so guys, don't be going, well, wife, you need to submit. No, 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 no. You, just let, let her and the Lord figure that one out. Now, here's your verse, guys. Here we go. It's for me. Husbands, in the same way. What have, we been, what have we been talking about? What do I do in relationship to government? Submission. If I'm a slave, what do I do in relationship to my master? Submission. If I'm a wife, how do I relate to my husband? Through submission. And then he says, in the same way. Guess what Peter's talking about? Submission. Who do you submit to? The Bible literally says, dwell with her, dwell with her with knowledge. In other words, there is something that is self-evident that you don't need to get away from. She is the weaker of the sex. Um, be considerate live, and live with your wives and treat them with respect. Now, that word actually should be translated honor. As the weaker honor and as heirs or co-heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Now, Guys, I, I mean, I, I, um, I mean, it's, women have 44% less bo upper body strength. They have 30% less lower body strength than us guys. Women, although I do want to say this, um, Kyle, do you ever do a deadlift? How much can you do? In front of the house of the Lord and everybody telling the honest truth, what is it? You ain't even going to say, are you? Oh, come on. I was going to ask Justin how much Justin could do left. He's like our, our beefcake here at church, you know. And I was going to ask him how much could he lift. Th there was a lady, a woman this year that broke the standing record for, for a deadlift. Steve, how much did Joel ever lift? Do you remember what his highest deadlift was? 640 pounds. Incredible. This woman this past year, she deadlifted 641 pounds. So I don't know if Peter had her in mind when he wrote this text. It's like, if, now if I was married with her, I would submit. Amen? So it's, baby, whatever you need, whatever you want, I am there for you. But hey, ladies, just to be fair, women have greater longevity than men. 
Of the 43 people that are known to have lived over 110 years, 42 of them are women. So I'm just saying, there are some benefits. I understand little baby girls have uh, more resilience than little baby infant boys at birth. There's, so there's some interesting things going on. But nevertheless, I think what Peter's saying is, do not bully your wife. Do not throw your weight. Do not threaten. You know, when you, say, when, when you think about the weak, when it's saying, you know, treat her as the weaker partner, it's not, that's not a slap in the face for ladies. That's God telling us men, look, I know how I created you and I know how I created her. You treat her how I designed her to be created, to be treated. And that's what we're called to do. No one is in a disadvantaged position, position when we submit. Mutual submission, mutual respect, mutual honor. So the question is, as we close out this morning, will I submit? Do I trust God enough in my relationship with my wife and in my relationship with my husband, if I'm a woman, um, will I trust God? Well, I trust God to work out his mission as he wants, you know. And some people might, might say, well, I won't submit because he's not acting worthy. Or I'm not going to honor her because she's draining the life out of me. Do your verse. You do your verse. Do your verse. And your verse is to submit and Jesus is your model. Jesus brought us into family. He saved us and delivered us because of submission. He is declared Lord because of submission. Peter will say later on, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. Submission is the doorway that opens us to the blessing of God. If we can serve any of you this morning, we ask you to come forward. Let's all join together in worship.